Testing, one, two, three. Taping now. All right, so you have a emergency situation with the homework, my email address, phone number, <laughs> but don't expect a reply every time you call. Um, so I, I, I was hired in 2009, uh, in, in first business day of January, and I had to hold the uh, advisor meeting before I actually had access to the lab. The, the project was very urgent and I kind of studied uh, a little bit late, but then we caught up. So before we start the lecture, I want to say that, that, that there is a chance to do real uh, nanoscale X-ray microscopy experiment. That might be mine. And the time is uh, May 26, Friday, 2 to 6 p.m. And then um, what you need to do, add your name in the sign-up sheet, sheet here. Don't worry about the column for US citizen, because everybody has to register. And once you feel it, then the uh, admin will contact you and give uh, a link for uh, registration. So you have to put your name and affiliation and things like that. And there are a whole bunch of questions you don't know how to answer. Just select any government form, you answer best as you can and hope the best. And if it's wrong, they will give you a call back or send it back and you have to feel more. At least it's not like you know, tax for Right, and you, you don't get bad grade yeah. either. <laughs> Just do it as soon as possible. And once you register, uh, your user status is valid for two years. So then you get to say on your resume you are the uh, active user of the uh, major national user facility, if you count something. And the, uh, you must take uh, uh, online safety training courses. There will be four, uh, but I'm sure that you're very good at taking tests, so it won't take too long. And then, people who went through this procedure will come and meet me at the lobby area of building 743 by 1.30 p.m. on May 26. Then I'll go out and then make sure that you are processed, meaning that you will have a, a TLD, and then uh, you can safely come into uh, to the experiment hall. And then we'll start the, do some experiment. Okay, so who's coming? Two, only three, three, four, five, five. Okay. I was going to say if it's less than 10, I would not do it, but oh, there's not enough oh, ten people to be 10 anyway. That. All right, so less than five, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> All right, so ju just in case that, that you, you need more help or material, these are the things that I use. I took some information from X-ray data booklet. And, and, and um, in the homework, I'll ask you to go some uh, website where do some calculations. So these are kind of practical skills that you will learn. And I really admire this guy, uh, Professor David uh, Edward. He wrote a nice book and he has nice lecture notes. And I copied some of them and I you know, get the credit for his whatever I used. And if you really want to learn, there's a nice topical review paper. Uh, called transmission emission emission means fluorescence X-ray microscopy, and it's kind of recent a review article. Uh, the nice images and uh, interesting things. So, okay, today's lecture. Uh, we will kind of go through a, a brief overview of different types of microscopy, and I'll try to connect to uh, Bucket's previous lecture if, if possible. And then we'll talk more about uh, X-ray microscopy. And so I'll introduce a few key concepts. And I'll talk a lot about nanofocusing optics. And, and uh, in particular, even more on zone plates and multilayer labyrinths. And, and kind of funny names you will get to know. Uh, uh, and then lastly, I will uh, uh, show you some things from uh, uh, Nanoflow. And let's go from here. So I think that the Wacket already told you about full field microscopy. So in a, in a similar way, a simple way, the full field microscopy is the most na natural way of looking things uh, through lens. Okay, so your eye is full field. Any microscope you have seen is using full field. The full field means that you're taking an entire image at once. Okay. Um, 
it's kind of simple. You have a some sort of light source, you can sample, and you have the uh, uh, optics or, or lens, and then you form an image of the object uh, on the detector. In your eye, the retina, and then for optical microscope, uh, you can put a digital camera and so on. And it follows with a simple lens formula. I mean, uh, has anybody seen this formula? 1 of f equal uh, 1 over this distance plus that distance. Okay, so this is a very uh, uh, simple concept. And then the ratio of the two determines the uh, magnification. For example, if this longer this is, the bigger the magnification is. Right, so. And the important thing is the resolution is determined by the optics, not by number of pixels of, of a detector. So uh, people have this advertisement where it look like if you buy the most number of pixels, you will get better resolution. That's not true. It's determined by how good your lens is. A scanning microscopy, I can say, is a kind of an unnatural way of doing uh, imaging. But it's still uh, uh, intuitive uh, to physicists or scientists. Uh, um, the way you can think about it is inverting the full field imaging system. So in the full field imaging system, you have a light source and a sample and a, and a lens, and then you form an image. And what you Conceptually, what is like you switch between light source and the detector, and that becomes your uh, scanning microscope. That's kind of a formal way of thinking, but in a practical way, basically you have a some sort of lens or lens system, focus down a light source, or, or form a smaller image or onto a focal plane, and then uh, you examine the sample with a very small beam. So in this case, the uh, uh, beam is smaller than object, so you cannot form an entire image of the object. So what you need to do is you need to uh, uh, either raster the uh, uh, entire optical system against the sample, or more simply, uh, raster scan the sample against the uh, stationary optical system. So uh, uh, what is an example of such? Uh, uh, if you have seen all the TV set, which had the electron gone and scanning around like this. I don't know if you saw this. That's a scanning system. And SEM, that some of you may have used, scanning electron microscope, is a, a type of a scanning microscope system. Uh, again, the rule is the same. You form, either you image it, or form an image, and then you can uh, vary this relationship to, to uh, a small beam. And then, uh, the how small the beam becomes in relation with the source, it follows the same simple relationship. So has anybody used SEM? No? Okay. Um, important thing here is again, uh, resolution is determined by the, uh, uh, ultimately by the lens, which creates a small focus. So the better the lens, the smaller Oh wow, smaller beam spot become, and then you can uh, have a very uh, good resolution. And why people do that is very simple. For the uh, transmission uh, microscope, which forming an image like this, the detection is only through the transmission, right? So, so it's like um, you, you, you're getting a chest x-ray, you have to see through it. But in case of a scanning microscopy, you don't have to do that. You can do anything you can think of. You can uh, uh, put any signals, and get any signals from the sample uh, to uh, study. So again, I was a little bit ahead of uh, my slide. I have a more uh, detailed information here. So as I said, the reason why we do scanning is that you can take all kinds of uh, uh, interaction from sample and use it as a a way to image. For example, you can uh, take the absorption, transmission, and figure out the density. And the, uh, in some case, you can also use a different uh, polarization of, 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 of X-ray. And the, uh, using a, a dependency of a polarization uh, to the magnetism, uh, using that relationship, you can also uh, image the magnetic uh, property of the material. And you can also uh, do spectroscopy. And there are different 
uh, type of things, the most common one people really use for how the X-ray is the fluorescence. So when X-ray hits the material, then the, uh, you probably had lecture before. The, the knockout electron from uh, its ground state and then and they evacuate hole, create a hole and then electrons in, in a higher level will cascade down at, and emitting uh, radiation, uh, in this case X-ray. And so by putting X-ray in and observing an uh, emitted X-ray, you can sort of uh, uh, determine what is the uh, uh, atom that you are probing because the, all the electronic level and energy levels uh, uh, depend very uh, uniquely on the type of uh, uh, atoms. Okay, so uh, uh, I would like to emphasize you can do anything you can think of. It's limited to, uh, to your imagination. So uh, you can hook up a, 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 some sort of a, a current uh, device and then create a, a beam to generate a, a electron hole pair. And you can, you can uh, collect these electrons, and this is a, a valid way to do it. Okay, so the, the most comprehensive, comprehensive uh, application of scanning X-ray, in, in a simple way, is collect as much signal as possible in one shot. And this is, was a, a fundamental design, the approach for the hot X-ray nanopro beam line. And let me explain from, from this side to that side. So using a, a, a synchrotron, we create a secondary source. I, I will mention a little bit more later. The way we create is we image the uh, beam coming out of the synchrotron, create a small source using optics. And then we can put a nice slit to choose the uh, radiating uh, property of that source, uh, namely the uh, source size, and to some degree uh, other aspects like uh, coherence uh, length. And then the monochromic beam is focused by a, a, a lens. And then there are various signals that are coming out of sample are collected simultaneously as much as we can. And of course, some samples do not give all kinds of signals, so we get whatever we can. So uh, just about all samples uh, are produced fluorescence X-rays. Um, so we, we can collect those and then that there is a, a X-rays transmitted through, we can use those transmitted and scattered X-rays to measure the uh, sample density and the morphology or shapes, uh, density distribution, things like that. If the sample it happens to be uh, crystalline, then some X-rays are diffracted, and we can control how the beams are direct diffracted uh, to the detector and study uh, various uh, crystalline uh, properties. So next slide, I don't want you to, I don't expect you to know all of it, but I'm just having a little bit of a, a collection of names. People, scientists love to invent new acronyms. Sometimes they mean the same thing, but then if, if there is excuse to find some difference, they put new acronyms, three to four letters long, and, and that, that's why we have all these different names. But I, I have a rough translation to what those are. So uh, if you pursue a uh, microscopy, you will see a whole bunch of things like this. So generally, there are techniques that measure a, a what I call real space, which means uh, measure the uh, uh, sort of non-diffracting uh, information of the sample, so like density or composition. And, and, but there are also techniques that use the diffraction. So, so in that case, you are exploring the reciprocal space. So uh, you can measure the uh, strain and the uh, uh, orientation ordering and things like that. And the, uh, uh, there is a funny technique uh, that uses the coherent property of X-ray. I have another slide to show that. So there, there, is, there are huge, uh, dif hugely different applications and, and, and good diversity. All right, so uh, going a little further to uh, some uh, uh, particular experiment. As I said that uh, uh, in soft x-ray, uh, you can use the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, polarization of uh, incoming light, whether it's uh, circularly polarized, which means that uh, your, your helicity, anybody know what helicity is? Okay, so, so the, 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 you can say uh, uh, sort of a polarization vector of the beam. 
uh, is going around the circle, whether is it right-handed or left-handed. And then if you write the uh, sort of a very complicated uh, interaction uh, formalism, there are some a second order or third order terms that uh, uh, depend on such interaction, which has very small uh, uh, signal. But nevertheless, you can use that. So in this case, the researchers uh, use uh, different uh, polarization. And uh, looking at the polarized to uh, uh, right-handed and minus left-handed and divide by the total. And then in that case, they can, they can actually see the uh, magnetic domains. If you're interested, you can go ahead and read more about it. And I, I mentioned that uh, people can use um, a spectroscopy. In this case, what they did was uh, put beam in a different areas, and then you change the, uh, uh, the uh, incident X-ray beam energy, and looking at uh, how much absorbance or the uh, transmission you're getting, and then it gives you a nice uh, spectra. And you can see there are different areas, different uh, uh, features, which means that chemically they are, are different. So what you can do is uh, uh, focusing on a certain feature, for example, maybe the intensity of this P versus that P, or anything other you can think of that's, that's related to uh, uh, chemical um, the chemistry of the, of the material and then you can perform uh, imaging and in this case the, this intensity is related to the ion 3 plus here is ion 2 plus so now they can uh, not only measure which element is uh, what kind of uh, oxidation state is it's very important to understand the chemistry uh, a micron or the nanoscale level. And in this particular case, it was done in a, a soft x-ray. Uh, look at the energy, it's several hundred dBs. Uh, one uh, uh, advantage of using soft x-rays is that you have a, a strong um, a sensitivity to a light element, like a carbon, oxygen, so they can see water, they can measure protein, things like that. How the x-ray is done, have any sensitivities to go right through. So, so uh, organic materials and light uh, matters uh, uh, should be studied by uh, low x-ray, um, low energy x-rays. Okay, this is the one of our work. And then uh, we demonstrated using uh, 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 high resolution uh, 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 imaging probe. Uh, we can study all these things uh, together. So for example, we can measure the uh, elemental composition. We can measure the uh, phase gradient. I'll mention what these are. And then do a mathematical uh, analysis to figure out the phase. And then we can also say uh, something about the composition by looking at the, uh, the uh, index of ratio of the index refraction, which tend to have also a unique fingerprint uh, to the material or composition. So, uh, this shows that uh, they can do uh, uh, multiple uh, contrast mechanism imaging at, at simultaneously and get uh, a very uh, interesting uh, and comprehensive uh, uh, information from sample. The next one is, uh, again, is one of my paper. This is using a micro beam. The way we did was, uh, uh, have you heard, uh, anybody heard the common materials uh, synthesis? Of combinatorial uh, material science. So the, the way they do is, if, if say for example there are three atoms, uh, think of in this case is germanium, manganese, and, 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 and uh, coal. You can form a various compound varying their compositions. You form different uh, phases, crystalline ordering, and, and and then have a different magnetic properties, but. Uh, you know, how many combination of such three? Infinite. <laughs> so you cannot uh, finish your lifetime just, just looking at all of it. So the clever people decided that, that they can uh, have a continuous composition map by having 100% here, 100% there, 100% there, and then vary composition across it. And then you can go and uh, uh, inspect a different part of the sample with different compositions and then try to understand uh, and screen uh, their uh, functionalities and, and structure. So in this case, uh, we had a sample that are 
sort of roughly like this, and then we went different part of the uh, composition, and, and, and they're looking to a lot of structures in reciprocal space, uh, looking at the crystalline structure and ordering and orientation, and we extract the quantities. In this case, is the uh, 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 position in, in reciprocal space related to stra strain, so the or uh, the, the, um, the size of the uh, unit cells uh, the, uh, of the crystalline structure. Here we can look at the intensity that related to the uh, the high intensity is associated with a high crystalline ordering. So again, there is a way to visualize things. It's not just composition. You can extract any quantity and, and, and then visualize. So uh, there is a huge uh, uh, diversity and, and a different uh, way to do the, this kind of a, a micro nanoprobe uh, measurements. Okay, uh, since this is a sort of a, a topical View type of class. I'm not going to go into details, but I'm going to introduce a few concepts. So the, I, I've been talking about now the, still the second type, which is scanning. The third type of microscopy, I say, is the strangest of all. And, 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 and if you're not a scientist, uh, I, I, it would take me a whole day to explain. And, and probably I'll never fail. So, the way they do is a very bizarre. So, uh, you take a, a coelom x-ray, and then coelom x-ray comes in scatter, okay? And you record a, a, some sort of a pattern far away. And the problem, the mathematical problem in this case is when you um, measure uh, the, whatever the signal from the sample, it is intensity. So what is intensity? Intensity is uh, your complex the structure factor, oh, I'm sorry, uh, but is uh, absolute value. Okay, I made a mistake. It should be a square. All right. So if you module a square, the phase is all gone. You only know uh, information about your amplitude, but phase is gone. Uh, that's the usual case, but if you use a very coherent beam, I'll explain what really coherent is later. There is a way to uh, retrieve the both the amplitude and phase of the object and then get more information than, than uh, otherwise. So the way to do it is very bizarre. But I'll try to explain the best I can in the simplest way. So because you took the modular square, you lost the phase. If you think of a sample uh, with a size uh, n by n dimensions, and each point of the sample, there are two quantities you can extract. One is amplitude and phase. But if you take the modular square, the half of the information is gone. So you, 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 you cannot solve it because half the information disappears. So how do you get the half back? The way you do that is a tricking uh, uh, sort of a mathematics by creating a, a region outside of the sample and uh, we will call uh, and then set the uh, uh, phase on our side uh, and intensity just zero. All right? And then so that at least you have an equal number of uh, 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 um, uh, parameters and let the computer uh, extract it in this way. So this is a diffraction pattern. Again, it's intensity. And you just assume that the, your phase is a square root of intensity, which is fine, because phase is gone, so you don't care. And you take a, a random a phase. Usually, it just is uniform to start with. And then you start from here. So now, you uh, assign each pixel a, a um, amplitude from experimental data, but random guess of a phase, and just Fourier transform back, okay? And then you will some get garbage, because you, you introduce the wrong information anyway. But what you do is, you create an area called support, and set all the things outside zero. Uh, th th this trick is to, you have an equal number or more, a, a, a equations you can solve. So the requirement here is 
the number of pixels outside should be at least equal to the number of pixels inside. If you don't do it, it will not uh, work. But that's not a difficult uh, requirement. People just create a large area and set it to zero. Okay, and then you have Fourier transform back. Again, you, you, you sort of mess up the uh, uh, process, so what you come back is garbage. And now what you do is, you do a, a very interesting thing. You take the phase that created by the process and replace a, the intensity, uh, the, the amplitude, based on the experimental data and put it back. So now you have a data, uh, 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 the, the amplitude based on data, but the phase uh, obtained by this process, and you going, keep going, keep going, until uh, the um, difference between the uh, 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 so, um, difference becomes so small, which means uh, uh, they are converging. So once you think that it is a converging sufficiently, you stop it, and then uh, you hope that this is actual object. Obviously, uh, this is a, a, a not a very simple process, and people thought about it for a long time. But uh, it was the first demonstrated at, at NSLS two, group by Stony Brook. And there was a professor called uh, Janusz Kurt. He was a faculty member here and a student now. is a, a very bright guy and, and, and very famous now. To first demonstrate that uh, you take a, sort of a, a letter written by gold dots, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then take the diffraction pattern and manage to recover the, what it looks like. He had an advantage because he knew what it was. So he kind of uh, <laughs> grinded to the all the way until he figured it come out so nicely. But this technique actually, it, it does work. So people are, are using this technique to uh, start things that are not known. In this case is the uh, a pattern of uh, E-cell. Okay, so you get this information, this kind of uh, uh, image of the cell from this kind of information. All right. David Shapiro is also a student here. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. And now he's an ALS. He's a very successful uh, uh, scientist. Uh, uh, people were not very happy with that because uh, you will have 10 people uh, uh, doing the same measurement, only one or two people get result. Even the same guy, it, depending on which day uh, it was, the universe is lined up, you get the result, and other days, days you don't get. It's very really sensitive and all kinds of uh, things happen. The way you to, to force the convergence, there is a lot of, of methodologies developed based on how you set it. Uh, so there are many papers on how to do that and it's almost like a, a very secret recipe. And mostly it works uh, for the sample you study, but uh, if you try to use it for other sample, uh, it may not work all the time. And they discovered now a, a most very reliable way. So instead of doing that, uh, the idea is uh, uh, rather intuitive. Suppose you put a coiling beam in one side, one part of the sample, okay? And then you think that if you move the beam by 50% over, all right? Because you're eliminating the identical part of the sample, 50%, the 50% of the uh, information is the same as before. So only the uh, additional 50% is uh, unknown, okay? And then if you do scans uh, uh, going around, overlapping 50% each other to neighbor, this part is overlapped significantly by uh, neighbors. So uh, this has an effect of reinforcing a solution and, and then give you more uh, uh, redundancy in, in your measurement. And, uh, uh, it works well in, in a sense that uh, the reconstruction is very stable and now people start to reproduce results across the laboratory. And this was like a big discovery. And everybody's now using uh, uh, this is a very interesting technique called tychography. And you can tell whether you're an expert or not by just say how people pronounce the word. <laughs> <laughs> And just to show, uh, give you some sense of how we do that, uh, in our group, uh, 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 experts on this field is working together. 
So this is a simulation. So we create a, some sort of sample, which is a famous picture of Lina. Uh, uh, and then we simulate situation. You put a beam at different part. And based on uh, calculation, we look at what the diffraction pattern would look like. And it's going in a funny, spiral manner. The reason we do that uh, is kind of a beyond the scope of this lecture, but at least in this way that the, 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 the overlap uh, to the neighbor are, 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 are conditions met so that uh, you, uh, you, you can uh, have a good convergence. And you can reconstruct uh, your, at the end, your a, a object, and at the same time, a, what the beam uh, 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 it should look like in both amplitude and phase. So going back, a, a most intuitive way to explain is is very complicated, a deconvolution of process that the information you get, which is a signal from sample, is a convolution of the X-ray and a sample, and using a Toyden property and mathematical a trick to recover this through which. Uh, phase, uh, the reconstructed uh, recursive method, you can intelligently decouple your a, a probe, which is a beam, and object. And uh, it works. Okay, so um, uh, that summarized my uh, sort of overview on different kind of techniques. And now I'm going to go to more uh, bolts and nuts, nuts and then grind down the uh, more rigorously some key concepts so that uh, watch out because these are the part where the homework problems come from. <laughs> <laughs> no credit on the homework problems. <laughs> All right, so the first obstacle I have to go through is what the hell means coherence? You can say a person is not speaking coherently. All right, you don't have a coherent policy. All right, but uh, in, in a way, mechanics, the coherence means, okay, before I say it, Let's take a vote. Which of these two patterns are more coherent? Anybody think is that's more coherent? Why? See, the question is why? Okay, so one way to think of it is uh, this is more complicated. But the complexity is not related to coherence. The co concept of coherence relates to the predictability. In other words, in this kind of simple sample, if I measure something here, I can predict what's going to happen here. Okay, so the, the relationship between a, a, a phase of the wave from one part to other is well established. If it is a perfect spherical wave, all you need is one measurement at a certain point. You don't have to know anymore. It's fully coherent. Okay, so I can say word that way, but mathematically. It just mean it is the correlation, okay? If the hundred percent co correlated is your one, if it is not correlated, it's zero, okay? So uh, uh, in in reality, people talk about normalized degree of special coherence, which is just uh, uh, this divided by the, uh, the the size of each uh, 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 field. So, so that therefore is not normalized. So why do I bother to talk about this? Uh, that's because uh, a high degree of coherence is needed to get the best uh, interference fringes. Okay, why we need that? If more the coherent your light is, the more coherent, the, um, the better we can focus it down to small size. Or any process or, or signal is obtained from that uh, is well understood so that you can actually have a better hope to recover. So again, uh, we reiterate that uh, to achieve the best focusing, a, fo a focusing optic must be illuminated by coherent waveform. If not, then uh, we don't get the uh, best focusing. So another way we uh, kind of a graphically visualize, which is the same as what I said in, in equation and word, uh, you have a, uh, two examples of a highly coherent wave. One is a spherical wave, in that if you make your measurement mark here, any place, and you can relate to the, uh, what's happening on the other part. 
And in a plane wave, which is a sort of a ripple going across a space in one direction, uh, if you know the wavelength and, and, and travel velocity, you measure one point, you know what's going to happen to the other place. Okay? So, um, a, in, in a formal way, they distinguish two types of uh, uh, coils. One is called the transverse or special uh, coil. That tells you about how the waves are related to each other in, in, in space. The other one is called longitudinal or temporal coherence. Is how the, uh, the wave, how wave is correlated from one position to the other in a time. So, so if it's a nice pattern, you know what's going to happen. If it's not a nice wave, it's very complicated. The, your prediction is not as good. Okay. So the, uh, uh, in an academic way, people made the definition of what the longitudinal coherence is. And if you type this word in a Google, you get probably a 10 lecture <laughs> notes, <laughs> which I copied the uh, equations. And but the uh, uh, people wrote a different way to do. And so depending on the, your personality, they argue slightly different. But um, the way it goes is this way. Suppose you have a, uh, a, a nice wave. What would be the a wavelength or uh, distance you have to travel before you get completely out of phase. And you call that distance a, a, a longitudinal or temporal coherence distance. Okay. So the way you prove is uh, this is difficult to do. So you actually let it go until you meet again. And then they differ by a one uh, period in this way and solve and you arrive in, in relationship that the longitudinal coherence is wavelength squared divided by 2 uh, divided by the uh, uncertainty of your wavelength. Okay? So uh, in, in a physics, people use the same definition in a very um, uh, many different way. So if you understand one concept in you know, one field, it goes a long mileage. Uh, for example, this is the same way we define monochromacy. Uh, how monochromatic beam is, and, 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 and then there are very a, 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 a nice uh, formalism so that, 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 that there are definitions that are very equivalently defined so that uh, it's rather uh, uh, semi-universal. And a, a, a for uh, signature application, when we prepare a monochromatic beam, we use the uh, uh, silicon a crystal to diffract. Uh, in that case, uh, we relate how good your monochromacy is based on what is your energy and what is your spread of energy okay, in the same way. And this is also a, a very a similar to definition when people use uh, multiple slits and talk about how the width of the, uh, uh, these um, uh, same function is related to uh, slits. Okay, and there is a concept called diffraction limit and transverse coherence. Uh, it's a little bit uh, key to a lot of uh, microscopy techniques. Uh, uh, so I'd like to introduce what that really is. Um, what is a diffraction limit? A uh, diffraction limit, uh, you can say, uh, based on the wave nature of a photon which is related to the uncertainty principle. Basically, my homework is on this, so I have to pay attention. And there is an ultimate limit of how well one can determine the source size and source angle. Uh, they go by a different name and height. You can say source size and source angle. You can say position and momentum, or the uh, time difference and energy. So they're all equivalent. So in quantum mechanics, you already learned about uh, delta x times delta p. It, 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 it cannot be smaller than a certain amount. The relations it can be a sort of a, a, a trans, a, a, a translate into a delta t times delta e. All right. So we are doing the same thing with the delta x and angle. Okay. So in a similar way, if you look at the source size and source angle, the product of the two 
uh, is related in this way. And in fact, uh, 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 this is the best estimate is usually bigger than that. So, so usually the product is bigger than that because that's the best uh, possibility. So usually poor this. And here uh, one needs to pay attention uh, uh, what you're talking about in terms of what unit you're using. In this case, you're using RMS unit or simply say that uh, uh, in Gaussian you have a sigma. Or another way of saying is a full width f max. And people unfortunately tend to mix this too. And then if you're a student, you get confused and you can be off by a lot of uh, factors. And so uh, my homework uh, will ask you how to derive this, right, uh, based on a uh, uncertainty principle. Okay, so from this uh, expression, one can talk about the coherence length. Okay, so I said the. Uh, in order to uh, have a best focusing, the, the, the optic must be illuminated by a coherent uh, wave. What does that mean? The, the size of the coherence length has to be bigger than the size of optics, then you eliminate it coherently. So how do you do that? It's very simple. You, you notice that the uh, uh, angle, source angle, what is the source angle? Is uh, how source is spread in certain distance way. So what is the angle? The angle is just this dimension divided by the distance. That's a source angle, and you plug right into this, and you get this relationship. Okay, and so this is a, this is a measure of defining how coherent your beam is. So one thing to point out is there is an uh, interesting relationship. For given same thing, the bigger the wavelength, uh, uh, you can get more coherent. Bigger the wavelength means lower the energy. Okay, so the, as energy gets lower and lower, is more coherent. In other words, uh, with the same uh, relationship, visible light can be more coherent than X-ray or, or UV. And with the fixed wavelength, the farther you go out, you can get a greater uh, coherence length. Uh, you can think of it this way. You have a, some sort of a, a crappy wave that creates some sort of a, a wave. As you further go out, the, only the small portion of the wave uh, would be observed between two points, okay? Uh, so in fact, if you go infinitely far away, it looks like a, a plane to you. So in that case, uh, this wave is totally predictable. So it became plane wave, right? So, so that's very intuitive. Another way is to make the source size as small as possible, then you become a, a point source, then automatically it becomes a very coherent. So uh, uh, even if you don't understand the relationship, you should kind of intuitively understand uh, you know, how, how these uh, formulas is related to each other in, in describing different quantities. Okay, so now let me put a little bit of a, a, a quiz on how small we can focus X-ray. Okay, so when I got hired at the NSLS2, my first job was to make the smallest lens we can, I mean smallest focusing lens we can. So. We had the goal of focusing down to one nanometer, and I convinced my uh, bosses that, that that's kind of a difficult. So just give me some breaks, so we'll do 10 nanometer. Okay, but 10 nanometer is very small still. Uh, so, suppose you have this kind of a, a schematic um, uh, situation where we have a, a monoconic being and then you can just use a, a, a sort of magical slit to define how much you can see the uh, actual source. So this D becomes now the uh, effective source size. Uh, and then you have a focusing optics, a, a focusing optic, and then you uh, produce a little small spot. And then let's say you have uh, such a relationship. You have 100 meters away from the source and 10 millimeters from that distance. Okay, it's like a, a simple case. And you follow um, this simple relations of demagnification. You have a, a factor of 10 to the 4. So if D a was a 10 millimeter, uh, a small d becomes 1 micron. Okay, so that's good. So uh, we can do that. So two d is not a big problem. And the uh, next question is then, okay, why don't we notch up this 
see how, how much we can go. We make now this one micron. Can we achieve focus size of one angstrom? That's a gotcha question. So what do you think? Okay. So uh, what, what length will move? <coughs> Wake up, everybody. What wavelength X rays is he talking about? Oh, uh, well, uh, X ray wavelength is probably uh, uh, still one angstrom, but uh, okay. Maybe my example was a little bit too generous. I should have said uh, 0.1 micron and then 100 <laughs> picometers. If it were that simple, I would lose my job. <laughs> <laughs> if the stuff was simple, somebody would have done it before. So, so this is best represented by this curve. Okay? So as we are putting a, a, a magnifying glass a, 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 a lens on a sun or the paper, it can, it can go back and forth. Uh, and then as you can uh, reduce uh, a spot size making these uh, the magnification size uh, bigger and bigger. Uh, initially, it relates, respond linearly. And at some point, it cannot go anymore. The reason why, the electromagnetic wave do not want, they don't want to be confined. They, they diffract when they make it small. So you can do experiment uh, with the, all kinds of way. You can take a small uh, opaque object, put it in a light, and start to make it close to each other and see what it looked like. Or I put a laser beam and then put two uh, aluminum foil to close, and what happens to the laser beam? Uh, it will start to get smaller and smaller, and at some point it doesn't get smaller. You actually get very big. You get diffraction pattern. So uh, uh, you can say you are imaging the source, or you can use a geometric uh, uh, optics relationship but then at some point, it cannot get smaller uh, beyond the diffraction limit. Okay. So that was a um, trick. And, 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 and the uh, sort of a, 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 a caveat that, that, that we have to overcome. Uh, so just to demonstrate how we use this uh, in a beamline, uh, you have an X-ray source from synchrotron and use some sort of beam optics to create an uh, image of the uh, X-ray source, we call it secondary source. And then we uh, start to uh, manipulate the size of this secondary source uh, and see how, uh, good, how well the beam get focused. The way we did was, you make this very small and, and reduce down to 15 micron, and then you scan and, and the resolution structure which is a, a 20 nanometer line uh, with the 20 nanometer separation, we start to see the dip, okay? And at some point when the dip is uh, sufficiently small, we can say it can resolve the two. And then you start to open up the, uh, the slits, and then boy, what happens? The, the contrast gets worse and worse, and then you cannot distinguish the two. So why? Because the, uh, your focus spot got bigger. And so in this case, we are close to diffraction limited. In this regime, we are on a geometric uh, optics case where you are linearly uh, uh, changing your focus size based on the demagnification. So I propose that we take a short break now uh, to go into the next uh, more complicated <laughs> topic. Okay. Good. Oh, by the way, this is okay. So, X-ray nano focusing optics. Okay. So uh, again, I, I believe in starting very slow. So I'll try to make some analogies. So we go uh, to the things that we know or have a good intuitive sense, which is the a visible light. How do we focus the light? We have two ways. The one is using lens. One is using mirror. Okay. And in fact, uh, 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 this is uh, also true for X-ray, but X-ray has another weapon. And the way you use lens and is whether you do it knowingly or unknowingly or what you're doing is you're, 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 you're relating a rays from the source to the focus. And in fact, uh, you can think of it as, as an ellipse. 
and your optics is, is sort of occupying uh, this position. And then whether it's across to here or across to there, that's how you are uh, uh, um, uh, bending your rays into the focus. So in other words, the relationship uh, of how the two source and the focus to the circumference of ellipse represent how the light uh, is traveling from uh, one to the other. And if you use a mirror, you don't refract the beam, you actually bounce the beam, but uh, uh, mathematically is identical. So you have a, a sort of a reflecting surface in a sort of elliptical uh, curvature, and the ray go from here, bounce, and form a focus. If the uh, curvature is not elliptic, then you have aberration, so the image is not very good. So I mentioned a little bit, but I just want to reiterate that uh, how does that lens work? The lens work uh, having a, a one point of the object, all the rays coming out of this, uh, uh, going into the lens, it gets recombined at the image. And so uh, one can, and then the relationship between the focal length and the distance between uh, here to there is related by this rule. So if you make the S a 1 infinite, then the uh, focal length is equal to the distance uh, from the uh, lens to the focus. And okay, so these are the pictures of different types of X-ray optics. So now we are skimming a little bit of the onion and then going deeper and deeper. So these are called compound reflective lenses. So uh, due to the peculiarity of X-ray, uh, interaction of uh, X-ray with the uh, matter, uh, where the, uh, the bending of uh, X-ray is exactly opposite of how the uh, visible light bends to the object, uh, they create a, a negative lens. And, and then that uh, acts like a real lens in optics case. So they tend to have a kind of funny shape. And there's another called kinoform. Uh, this is, I'm not going to talk about it, but I can say it in a word. Uh, if you have a number of lenses like this, and uh, there, are, there are parts of the material that does not contribute in focus. In other words, if you look at the phase of the X-ray going into the lens, the phase can only vary from uh, plus minus a pi. Anything bigger than is useless. If it's 3 pi, it's still 2 pi more than what you need. It only caused headache uh, by absorbing light. So what, what, what it did was you cut out the parts that do not have to be there and folded it, and then it, it, it had this funny shape. So, so mathematically the equivalent, except this has less material. Okay. And obviously it's more complicated to make. Another way uh, you can do, okay, here, which I show as the uh, equivalent to the uh, 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 analogous to the uh, mirror case is actually using a X-ray mirror, and the, uh, uh, instead of using a, a one mirror uh, focused beam, uh, uh, I'll explain why. Because the X-ray does not want to get bent uh, strong, that way it cannot bounce backward easily. You have to use a very shallow angle, so inevitably you have to have a very shallow angle, but still have an elliptical curvature so that you can collect the line and focus the point. In this case, you focus it in a vertical direction uh, with the horizontal optics, and focus it horizontal uh, direction with the vertical optics, and this is called capetric bias mirror. And do people, do people the Kirkpatrick bias mirror, do people know who bias is? Well, actually, yeah. his daughter. Yeah, Joan. Joan Baez is the daughter of the Baez. Okay. Kirkpatrick Baez mirrors. I, I don't know Joan Baez. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, singer. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. American music. Oh, I see. And then there's a way to make a, 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 a focusing optic using a waveguide, which is really similar to the way it works. Instead of having a single bounce, you can form a waveguide, and you'll be confined into a sort of a, a waveguide, you can bounce it, and then as you come out, uh, the beam gets focused. So, uh, and 
the, uh, there are a thing called uh, ozone plates, and they are called bacterial larvae, and I'll spend more time on this. So that, that's how they look like. So uh, let me spend more detail on compound figure lens. So as I said, uh, uh, it is a funny shape. The reason why it's a funny shape is because of the, this relationship. The, the index of refraction of the uh, x-ray is very small. In fact, it's less than one. So index refraction of the visual light is bigger than one. So does anybody know what the index of refraction of glass is, the glass for lens? Okay, it's somewhere around 1.5 to 1.7 and 8. Uh, but in, 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 in x-ray, uh, consider this is a, almost zero, and delta is that tiny. So, so you can consider that's how much uh, bending power of x-ray, bend not much, very little. Okay, so let me just say more in details. So uh, in homework, there is a website I show you, you can go there, you can actually get these numbers. Okay, and, and, and I actually got it from there. So at 10 kilovolts, the delta of the beryllium is about three times 10 to minus six. And you can say the, the, the bending angle is uh, about uh, three micro right? For a uh, following a simple relationship, where R, I'm sorry, I use the big R, it's the small R. If you plug that, is the focal length due to a single lens uh, with, a, with a radius curvature of a half millimeter, which is tiny lens, uh, which is quite, uh, the coverage is very strong. In, in, in case of a visible light, if such a lens it would focus really strong because it's very sharp, a uh, very big uh, radius curvature, the focal length is over 70 meters. So it doesn't get bent easily. So I brought a, a typical optics that we can use. You can pass around and you can look at the numerical aperture. Uh, that's a number uh, on there. It's like point, what is it, point 0.6 or something. You're, you're, you're not this, you know. <laughs> point four two. Yes, it's pretty large, right? And, and the higher the magnification, uh, it's the same company, <laughs> just to be consistent. That, 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 that's a, a 20x lens. I took the 200 x and uh, the medical aperture 0 0.6. What is the medical aperture? The medical aperture is the how the beam gets bent. So is the, if you think of this as a total angle, the half angle, I don't know why I use a half, but the, traditionally use a half angle is the full angle. It's called the medical aperture. And it's in radian, so it's pretty large. So, so, so. And the focal length is very small, okay? And the uh, resolving power, in this case resolution, resolution is close to uh, 400 nanometer. And the depth of field or depth of focus is less than a micron. I will also talk about that as, as I go. I just want to show you how uh, different between X-ray lens versus uh, uh, visual light optic lens. And the message here is that uh, X-ray bends very weakly, therefore, it's very difficult to make uh, uh, high power uh, optics. Uh, so, a, I'm not going to spend much time, but again, uh, the, the here using a, a KB mirrors, the idea is the same. In each case, you're putting the radiation from the source uh, reflected from uh, using an electrical surface, you focus the, on the uh, focus. Okay, so let me uh, explain more about zone plate uh, uh, because it's more interesting and it will require some knowledge about uh, uh, how grading works. Has anybody heard grading? Okay, don't worry about it. Fraction. Oh, 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 oh. They're just being shy. Okay, but, but although it's a very funny shape, the way it operates is simple. So the beam comes in, 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 in no, is normal instance to the uh, optic, and then the relation between the, uh, the source and the uh, focus is followed by the same uh, uh, condition. Um, so uh, I'll now tell more about these two. So uh, uh, first we'll talk about a zone plate. 
But before you go there, I, I'd like to uh, sort of uh, have you reminded uh, um, uh, of the key concept that uh, Waquet talked about. So I don't know if you remember this thing from last lecture. And then uh, uh, basically, if you look at the uh, uh, transmittance function, which is the uh, sort of a, a how you describe your sample. So your incoming beam, hitting all of your object, then you get the uh, transmitted uh, wavelength, uh, wave, wave field. And then object is represented by the uh, transmittance function. It has different parts. So uh, it parts due to the absorption, which is uh, due to the imaginary part of the index of refraction. And there is a, a, a phase also uh, is due to the real part of the uh, index of refraction. And sometimes you get uh, introduced a, a phase uh, shift. That's basically the length difference between how we get from A to B. And uh, if you have class on scattering, the phase shift is a very important concept in, in diffraction of physics because that's how you relate to uh, wave vector, uh, the, the, the Q on momentum transfer. So uh, uh, the way we formally relate is that uh, this, uh, uh, okay, so I'm not going to say much about this, but uh, uh, because I'm going to say more in, in, in later, uh, you have to understand how the phase shift happens. And uh, understanding this, you can see how uh, the rays get focused. So let me just go back to, uh, uh, go to this slide where uh, it describes the, uh, how the diffraction grading works. So the, uh, you can think of it as a uh, number of multiple slits, or the same can be described by the number of uh, antennas that are emitting uh, beam is all the same thing. And then you have a number of uh, uh, slits uh, forming a, a periodical structure, a monochromatic beam comes, and then it channels the beam into uh, positive direction or negative direction, or it doesn't channel. Okay, and then depending on the angles, uh, you can say uh, different order, zero order, first order, negative one, plus one, and so on. So the way you understand is very simple. You, you can relate a, a, a phase of the beam coming straight through versus one that made a direction by this angular relationship. And then relate how is the shift related to the wavelength? Okay, and then if you uh, imagine now it's small angle, so it's not side, it's just the angle. So angle is equal to a different order uh, in a scale of wavelength divided by the uh, size of the grading. And then that's how the diffraction occurs. Okay? And, uh, and the way the job plate work is that suppose if you can make the, this difference in, uh, if you make the opening of this grading non-periodic. In other words, you make this small here, and make it bigger as you go, so that all the rays are, are, are converging onto the same point. Okay? So I'm, that will cause the focus. Right? So, so it's equivalent to saying, okay, I get this grading, and I have another one that's slightly different despacing or uh, the period and so on and so on, and then you're making a continuous uh, change, then it will work as a focusing optic. So that's a principle behind a, um, a, a jump plate, okay? So, so the key concept to understand is this. So we create some sort of a, 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 a non-periodic structure where the, the phase shift of the beam uh, from each part of the structure are in phase, which means that uh, the, 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 um, they are a, a, a this ray is different by this by uh, lambda over two uh, uh, times number one and two. And these are like zone numbers. So as you go, a different zone numbers. Uh, if you create this kind of situation, then it'll be all in focus. Okay? So using this uh, relationship, uh, with a right, right angle triangle, 
Here is uh, f plus n times lambda over 2, and this is uh, f. And you form this kind of a relationship, and you can get all these uh, relationships. Okay? And what I want to pay, ask you to pay attention is that uh, in the case of grading, if the phase shift is due to a lambda over d, and in the joint place case is lambda over 2, uh, there's an extra factor of 2. The reason is based on the how people count. So in a grading, they count, OK, that's my one unit, and another unit, another unit. In a zone plate, we count the, uh, the dark and, 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 and the, uh, the white area separately. In fact, you can think of it as a pair. But you don't count as a pair, you count as individuals, so there's a factor of two difference. So they are full of this kind of factor of two floating around in physics, and, and, and in this case, there is a real uh, reason why. And I, I gave you this just to, for you to see. And the important information you need to understand is don't worry about the, everything else here. Just understand the numerical aperture, which is the angle here is related to basically uh, how big your lens is, uh, the radius, which is d over 2, uh, to the uh, focal length. So that's basically this angle here. And the, uh, uh, the numerical aperture is essentially defined by the diffraction of the, the, the smallest zone. Okay? So that is equal to the ray coming and then again uh, uh, pointed down which is a maximum angle, defined by the maximum angle is related by this way. Okay. So um, that, that, that's a critical uh, concept that, that you should pay attention. And again, I said uh, in physics there are a lot of analogous ideas. So uh, anybody know about Howard Breck, Breck law? Okay, and they memorized it and take exam and put plug some equation, you know, think they use a calculator, but they have the same thing. The crystal people call Bragg's law, and the, uh, the, the microscopy people uh, call the, uh, 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 what do they call? Uh, well, it, it, it's just the same thing. It just looks different. Consider in, 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 in diffraction, your unit uh, element is the uh, this spacing, okay? which is the uh, nearest separation of the atomic planes. Uh, in this case, is the uh, smallest uh, 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 diffracting element in the, uh, uh, or in the outermost zone of the uh, zone plate. And the formula is exactly the same. OK. So uh, this shows that, uh, 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 actually proves that the zone plate uh, uh, can image. So the way you can see is very simple. So. Uh, once you hear, you can do the mathematics later at home, but uh, you can very simply say this way. Okay, so you want, because the joint plate uh, 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 spacing ensures that every ray coming out of this at the end is, is in phase with, with everything else, if you take the beam coming from straight through without getting diffracted or straight through or the zero order diffraction, which is equal to P plus Q, and then consider one that coming out from uh, end order or end zone coming down. Because they are in phase, they must be different by uh, 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 lambda over 2 times uh, which uh, holy came out. Okay? So, so that's a key concept. And then if you do the math, you get the same equation that I, I showed you earlier about how the uh, optics work. So this shows that you can use this to image. Okay. So, sorry to show all the equations, but uh, I don't want you to know equations, but uh, understand uh, what, it, what it represents. So, if you consider the, uh, how the uh, beam get focused by the zone plane, in the focal plane, you can say that uh, it's, it's, it's described by the airy pattern 
Have you anybody heard Eric Hallam? Okay, so so and the 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 key concept here is that the force zero here is related to the uh, bending angle by this relationship. Okay, so uh, the fact that it's zero point six one is because this uh, area pattern, if you were Gaussian or sinc function, would be different uh, constant. So this this is a constant. Uh, depending on the uh, detail of the lens, but the uh, overall dependence is lambda over uh, the bending angle. So these are the things that happen over and over again in, 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 in microscopy and uh, diffraction physics. Okay, so since I talked about this far, I have to talk about what is mean by resolution. So the definition was uh, proposed by uh, Rayleigh, and he used this to distinguish the uh, two stars in the sky. Okay, so so um, you you take a photograph of stars, and what point you have the optic scheme, the system has sufficient resolution so you can uh, uh, separately see two stars. And he used a, a somewhat uh, a, a, a arbitrary definition. Although I mean, he used equations, so the way he defined is this. So consider there are a, 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 a light coming here and here, and each of them form this kind of a airy function. And and uh, of course they are separate far away. You can clearly see they're separated. So as you move closer, and what happens is they start to overlap. Okay, and then he just defined that. If the uh, another light source is separated by a, the force null, okay, and he defined that's the point we can consider we can resolve. So this is a, a one of the way of defining resolution, and and so in in that situation, the dip is a 26.5 less than the uh, peak. Okay, so so. Uh, in physics, when you say I'm resolving, it doesn't mean that I'm resolving to the baseline. That's uh, 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 okay, over-described uh, uh, condition. So, uh, okay, so using this criterion and using the sort of a relationship that, that, that I showed you earlier, and we plug in the equations from previous Uh, namely, mostly here. So you can kind of do the math at home. And the resolution is for the zone plate case independent of wavelength. It's only dependent on the, uh, the smallest uh, 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 the spacing, which it creates a maximum bending angle. Okay, right? So, uh, uh, um, and also note that, that uh, 0.61 is because we're using area pattern. If, if the different function is used, it will not be 0.61, it will be some other factor. Okay. All right. So we talked about now how the zone plate focused the beam in this direction. So we can relate the resolution uh, uh, by the uh, smallest uh, uh, diffracting uh, gap. Um, we can also talk about another concept which is the depth of focus or depth of field. So a, a, this is in, in some way related to the figure I showed you before. It looked like, uh, like that. So it, it note that it doesn't go up to a small number. So the, another way of saying is when I focus it, they don't cross to a point because uh, there is a diffraction limit. The light doesn't want to get confined, so they cannot get squeezed down to point. And that's the smallest distance it can squeeze. And then there are certain distance along the direction of the uh, travel of the light. The, the, the waste does not change appreciably. And this is the definition of the uh, uh, depth of focus. So if it is within the depth of focus, you will not uh, feel that object is uh, defocused or, uh, or better focused. It will look, appear to you almost the same, which is very convenient 
If this dot didn't exist, you will never focus your microscope. You will spend all night and it will never be focused. <laughs> okay. So this looks like a very nice uh, 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 object to use uh, to focus x-rays, but uh, there is a, a, a problem. The x-rays interact very weakly with the matter, which means most x-ray ones just pass by without interacting. Okay, so if you put a light here, in fact, only a small amount will get focused, rest will just, uh, un the, uh, just go past un un undisturbed. Which means if you use it this way, you will not get a small spot size, or you can use it like a lens. You, you, you will not, not see any difference, because uh, more than 90% will just right, go right through. So when we use, we use actually a, a, a more complicated arrangement. So first, we create what's called the auto sorting aperture uh, away from the focus in a such a way that uh, you allow only the first order diffraction to pass and block all the high order. Okay, so so this has to be well uh, uh, positioned or given the right. Uh, uh, opening, it has to be well positioned along this path, so that uh, you create such a condition. Otherwise, the other orders uh, will create uh, light coming this way. If you measure at the focal plane, it will not be focused. There will be other lights coming in. So thereby, it's called the auto sorting aperture. But that's not enough, because the uh, beam can go straight through and, uh, and here and create a, a big of, uh, intensity there. And then all the effort is, is wasted. So what you do is what's called the uh, central beam stop. So you have to make sure that no beam goes right through. And this becomes slightly bigger than that. So it's impossible to have a beam just passing the uh, central beam stop can go through OSA. And typically what we use uh, about uh, one third the diameter of the uh, uh, John plate optics to be a central stop, and the quarter of that, uh, the, the, the whole of the OSA. Okay. Okay, so this picture shows how uh, a real John plate looks. And notice that uh, it's not continuous circle. And this part is continuous. But then, it, 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 there's purposely introduced little segments. The reason why people do that is because uh, uh, any mechanical structure and, and with, the, with the outmost drawn, let me just look at the scale, this is 5 micron. <laughs> so <laughs> this is very small. And this drone plate was intended to be down to about uh, 20 nanometers. But uh, uh, here, you cannot see, it's 40 nanometer. The walls are pretty nice. And down to 20 nanometers, it starts to become not very good. On the average, it, it, it has a certain structure, but, but uh, locally, not very good. So the way we introduce this uh, segment is that the wall, if wall falls down, you, you don't have like a, a, you know, some houses, a fence, the whole fence just <laughs> falls down. Only the part of that falls down so that uh, you don't have a, a, a very a bad situation. And other people actually also put some sort of a buttress structure. In other words, you have that structure, but you put a little link across the material so that they cannot fall down. So how you do it is depending on how you used to do it. OK, so there is a limitation for uh, this kind of uh, uh, optics. The one is that uh, um, in order to get uh, uh, high resolution, you have to get a, a very small outer zone width. And in order to make the, uh, uh, this optic uh, uh, optimally performing, you have to make the thickness of, of the each, each uh, zone in a such a way that uh, the x-ray phase shift, uh, uh, shifted across that object by the phase factor of a pi or pi. So, uh, if you look at the, uh, how a phase is really written, 
anything bigger than pi is useless because it's absolute, the biggest quantity. So if it's bigger, then, then it's as good as taking a pi, a two pi down from this. So uh, there's no need to be thicker than that. Just to give you an idea, to get one nanometer resolution in total kilovolts, the, the, the separation to the wall height ratio, which is called aspect ratio, is the 2,000. So uh, that's very hard to make. Uh, uh, we can do something like aspect ratio 20. So that's the motivation factor for uh, using different technology. So uh, people still like to have this grading structure to focus, but then uh, uh, don't make them stand up in a, 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 a sort of a plane because they will fall down. But how you do that is, okay, you start with some substrate and you deposit different layers, okay? In a such a way that the relationship of the white to a black ratio or the, or the zone placement is exactly uh, described by the equation I showed you earlier. And then you will cut it Okay, and then use it to focus the beam. Unfortunately, if you do that, when you cut it, it's, it's, it's linear, it's not circular. It can, it, I don't know how to cut circle, I can just cut uh, straight. So, uh, unfortunately, you have to use two separate. You have to one in a, a, a focus one in the horizontal direction and the other in the vertical direction to create a focus. There's actually a nice uh, review paper uh, written by me and my colleague. Uh, and then talk about all the uh, latest uh, tricks uh, and then uh, details. And if you go look at how each zone looks like, uh, when it goes down to five nanometer, uh, because you're doing a deposition, uh, it's very nice. So the zones are very nice. And, and are What's the state of the art of, of the material for zones? So the use? best we, the people have done is down to two nanometer separation. And, that's and, and, and I have the numbers uh, down there. So uh, there's, there's kind of a, a, a concept that, 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 that introduced by us and used by us uh, widely. We are actually not using the entire lens. We're using only the part of the lens. The reason is uh, uh, um, you use the uh, typically a, a, a central beam stop. So if the central beams are introduced, introduce the portion that over the central beam stop, it looks like there is need to be no optics. You know why you put something there? We don't have to put it. So we can use. A, a, a your a allowance of your deposition thickness focus on the active part of the uh, optic that, that actually focus and therefore we use the uh, fraction of the lens and we can still do the same way and focus it. So uh, this is the table in the paper that I talked about and show you in this case that uh, uh, let's focus only on this one. And because we have to uh, terminate at some point, we describe that, that in order to focus to a 10 nanometer, uh, uh, we have to grow uh, uh, the zones from 4 nanometer to 20 nanometer. Uh, and, and that will satisfy the, uh, the structure that will focus beam down to 10 nanometer, assuming that there is no uh, lens aberration. Okay, so the, what's the uh, state of art? So uh, we wrote a paper that we can focus down to 11 nanometer, and then we make the uh, lens uh, to be as big as 43 and 53 micron in thickness. You think that's very small, but uh, most of the people who do coating, like the coatings used in the technology lab, you can use a coating to prevent outside or make some films. But all these uh, techniques are on the regime of micronish or even People who do MBE, they don't even deposit more than a few hundred nanometers. To, to, to do it in tens of microns, uh, a regime that, that, that in this field never have done before. 
and then it, it caused a lot of uh, problems and a lot of challenges we have to uh, overcome. So uh, obviously we want to make it bigger and bigger, but uh, uh, that's where we are. And this also show uh, that how the wave focus and, 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 and uh, go away from the focus. Here, you can actually see it literally the waste of, 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 of the beam. So it doesn't focus to a point. It focuses to a certain minimum distance and go. So another way people talk about it is because it, it looks like this is Gaussian. So they can say it's Gaussian optics as, a compo as opposed to a geometric optics where you consider only the, how the rays travel it goes to a crossing point, which is not true. Um, but there's some structure inside of that wave. Yes. The structure uh, uh, is there. Of course it's there. The reason why the structure is because of the very subtle reason. So let me kind of back up here. So there are, there are structure because of two reasons. So if you have a, a, a grading, a, 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 a diffractive optics focusing beam, the, the, this, the solution at the focus is not a Gaussian, it's an area function, which has a side lobes. On top of it, when we are operating using these lenses for real case, we introduce a central beam stop. So what it causes is called apodization. So what it does is that a, a Suppose this is a native uh, area uh, pattern, and when you put a central stop, uh, what happens? This become narrow, which is good, but there's no free lunch. Uh, some of the power is devoted from here to there. So, so uh, another way of saying is the, 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 the yeah. So, so it get devoted. So it actually becomes like. Okay, and plus. There is a small degree of aberration, so in that case, it does not make it symmetric. So we can also have something like that. instead of this, we could have slightly lower here, and then it will become a symmetric like this. And then it's coming in two different directions. And you take a slice, it's like that. But the important thing is, uh, if you simulate, uh, uh, knowing the uh, parameter of the lens, the uh, major data uh, reflects very nicely. So that means that we did a nice job in making it. Second, we understand how it works. OK, so now all the difficult part is over. So we. Quick question? Yes. Um, how do you measure an 11 nanometer beams? <laughs> very patiently. <laughs> <laughs> so, L let me backtrack and say how we measure anything. Uh, if the focus is very big, when I say bigger than 10 micron, maybe several micron, what you can do is you create the uh, X-ray uh, camera and then have the camera look directly at the X-ray beam. Uh, because the uh, resolution of the optic system you can say on the order of, at best case, on the order of, you know, uh, third of a micron or half a micron. You can still have enough resolution to uh, see the structure that are many microns wide. In that case, very easy. You just put a camera up and you tweak it until you get the intensity becomes small and small and small, and then you're done. And it just takes a matter of minutes. But if it's smaller than the you actually camera becomes useless. They all look the same because the structure becomes less than resolution. So what you do do is then is you use what's called a diffuse scan. So beam is coming down and you're focusing and see there's some structures and you make basically a blade and you scan through and either measuring the intensity pass through or intensity scattered by the, the object or uh, make these objects to material and measure the fluorescence. So, so you have some fluorescent detector measure this. And then basically in this case it will give you something like 
uh, DA. All right? And then you can uh, take the derivative, and, and they will become roughly like, I don't know, like this, and then measure the uh, estimate the width. Or you can use this sort of a, with a basal model and fit it, and then describe how this should be best described and relate it to the width parameter. Okay, so that's how we do it. But the fancy way we learned is actually none of these. You, we use these iterative phase retrieval method, and, and, and then we, in that case, it's different. We put a, a arbitrary uh, sample or known test pattern, and you start to uh, move around and collect uh, 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 the, the diffraction pattern. And remember, using this technology, you can decomponent the object and the beam. And you have a good idea what object looks like. So uh, at some point you say, oh, I like that the way it comes out, my object looks correct. And then whatever comes out at the, at the, at the, at the other side describes the beam. And that was actually the technique we used to measure this. Uh, otherwise, it would be very difficult. OK, so from now on, no more equations, no more formalism. It's just pictures. pictures of what we can do. And hopefully, uh, when you come to our beam line, you can actually do some more. So, this beam line has been a, a very, very complicated uh, uh, project. So, in terms of money, uh, I guess it's getting recorded. Uh, <laughs> when I saw the uh, closeout review on which person spent most of our money, and I spent, uh, as the level two manager, I sp uh, I'm sorry, as a group leader, I spent the second most amount of money from NSLS2. I spent $24.5 million coming from my account. And the first person spent close, close to $200 million because he bought all the magnets. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't have a fun. <laughs> yeah, that's bad. If he didn't buy all the magnets, you would business. <laughs> so well, the team. Depending on which year we're talking about, always it changes. This is actually an old picture. And then at the time, we already had uh, sub-members separate and then separate into same, a different team. One point, they are all in the same team. So there are folks who are developing a, a lenses, the folks who develop a uh, microscope, and how we manipulate the uh, sample and, and do a meaningful experiment and people who uh, design beamline and design techniques and do user support. So when you come and meet, you will tend to see these people rather than these people. And then we spend a lot of time doing other stuff like the data acquisition, data analysis, and there are key collaborators who contribute significantly from other part of the lab. And also there is very renowned uh, of uh, leaders of the uh, uh, leaders in the field, and some of them you should know, because uh, Chris Jacobson should be a, a, was a faculty member here, and now is with the Northwestern and IPS. Anyway, so with, with 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 this kind of team behind, we had a lot of discussions and a lot of conceptual design and R and D and and build. And I'm going to skip because I introduced that. So one of the a big challenge was uh, we have to spend extra money to build a satellite building. The reason we did that is because uh, oh, you don't want to have a lot of vibration in the, in the end station. And also we need to have a very good control of the environment, uh, meaning the temperature. Because the temperature drips and then things move around and then it uh, becomes not very good. And this is how one of the modules looks like. So uh, there, are, there are two key concepts in terms of instrument that we utilize. Uh, we use the uh, uh, stages using what's called piezoelectric. Has anybody heard? So piezoelectric means that uh, if you apply voltage, the material expands, or you force the material to be uh, strained, the, the voltage will come out. So, so some people actually use for generating uh, power, but we usually controlling a fine motion. The manner 
it, it, it moves, it's, it's very accurate because we can control the voltage very reliably. And nice thing about these, they don't generate a lot of heat. Okay, so, so we can uh, create a very low heat environment. And another technology we use is what's called the uh, uh, interferometry. So, so if you took a, a special relativity class that, uh, that shows is a, a Michelson uh, interferometer, and the technique is that you're using a, a beam, you split, and one comes back in a fixed mirror. Second, go to the other part, which is, is moving, and then you collect the light back and let them interfere. And if the uh, difference between the two is in phase, then, then your intensity is high. Uh, if it's out of phase, completely intensity is zero. So by now measuring intensity, you can infer what the small distance is as the wavelength of light as, as ruler. So, which is a pretty cool technique. So we use that to measure the displacement. But uh, the problem with that is we have to now carry a line and bounce off. And so we use optical fiber. So the coming in is okay, but then you just have to have a mirror everywhere uh, monitor this. Wait a minute, wait a minute. <clears throat> if you're looking for a resolution on the order of nanometers, that's, that's you know, a thousand from the wavelength of light. Aha! See, this is a good question. So, people have spent a lot of time trying to make it better. So, what, 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 what he's talking about is I have a wavelength of light like this. And that's your reference beam. And then return beam is shifted like this. Okay? And so if it's moving small amount, then, then you, okay. If it moves big amount, you see dramatic changes. But if it moves so small, some point will not be sensitive. So what we do is uh, uh, very particular. We only allow the displacement to take place in, in this side of the solar function, only the linear regime, namely here. Okay, so this is highly linearized. And, and, and then if the next wave is changed slightly, and, and the intensity varies linearly, and so we can get uh, typically uh, lambda over 100 easily. We can do lambda over 200. Uh, so what that means, the wavelength divided by uh, a few hundred can be achieved. So the type of laser we use is infrared. Say its uh, wavelength is one micron. Is uh, uh, we actually get uh, uh, a few angstroms. So we're actually doing lambda over a few thousand. So so. So that's another instrument, so I'm not going to show much, but a lot of fancy things and all of these took a lot of time to make it work and, and, and a lot of discussions and the, uh, we have to test a lot of things. Where's the zone plate? This is using zone plate. So, so the zone plates are housed in this uh, zone plate bank. We're so lazy, you don't want to change each time. You know. We can put up the four zone plates in here. Yeah. We can switch from one to the other. Depending on the energy range and then, you know whether it's a fine focusing or coarse focusing. Well, you don't want to go sticking your fingers in there. Either. Yeah. So yeah. Th this is actually within a vacuum chamber. So uh, we need to have a vacuum chamber for, for two reasons. One, if the temperature size is varying, then if you enclose, you don't have this air conditioning <laughs> drips come, whoosh, and here is a tenth of degree higher than the other areas to so give you a temperature difference. Uh, so if you have a shielded, then, then the, the whatever the temperature is damped. So, so we can damp by a factor of 10 easily. Second reason is uh, uh, we don't always want to use at room temperature. We want to actually cool things down, uh, looking at the uh, uh, low temperature. And when you cool down, uh, if you have a, a ambient air, you get a mess. All the moisture will freeze and then it's not good. So you have to have a dry environment. So uh, either use dry gas or vacuum to cool down. So uh, we have to um, create a, a chamber. But you have a you have a focal length uh, of of the zone plate, so it's less than a millimeter. No, the the 
Focal length is actually not that bad. Oh. Uh, 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 for multi-layer laminate lens, we, we have about five millimeter, four from five millimeter. No, no, okay. from, from, from the uh, uh, multi-layer laminate lens. Okay. Zone play is even bigger. We're talking about a uh, uh, couple of centimeters. Oh, okay. I, 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 but the distance, not to the optics, but to the OSA is, is it's, uh, uh, pretty small. So if the focal length is uh, uh, one, I, I said in there, we put a quarter away. So, so only a quarter of the uh, working, the focal distance is your working distance. So, so, and then that's an ideal case when you create a mechanical structure is actually uh, less than that. So for the high resolution microscope, we have about half a millimeter. <laughs> for, for the uh, zone plate application, depending on how we use, we get something like a two centimeters, or, uh, two centimeter, uh, and but, with the half a millimeter working distance, we actually did the tomography. Uh, that's a technique where you can get a series of projections as you rotate a sample. So we have enough room to rotate, because yeah. we take small sample, and get the three-dimensional uh, structure. I, I'm going ahead of myself, I'll show you that. So this is how it looks when you, uh, the upper part of the chamber is out. Okay? So we have a, a two chamber in one. And uh, uh, this tells you uh, what level of vibration we're getting. So uh, uh, this is uh, your a vibration spectrum of the sample measured in horizontal direction versus vertical direction. So if you are a, a, a sort of a expert, or you can pretend to be expert and say, oh, you have the resonant frequency at 160 hertz. So that's the, you, know, you have this uh, resonant frequency and uh, which is the worst condition. So at the peak of resonant frequency, we get about 1.6 in horizontal direction and 0.6 in vertical direction. Uh, so do you, do you know why they have a different resonant frequency in this direction and that direction? That's because the mechanical structure, okay, the resonant frequency relate to spring constant, how stiff thing is. So for example, my table is very stiff along this direction. It's not stiff along that direction. So, so it can kind of sway. <laughs> Whereas it's much harder to uh, uh, change distance this way. But if, 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 you know, if I put it this way, <laughs> it's harder here, True. much softer. So it, it highly depends on how you make the mechanical structure. So. Yeah, but in fact, you probably get an anti-crossing. Uh, you know, and in reality, it's much more complicated because you have many modes. We, we, let's think about a, a stage. What does stage have? Stage have a, 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 some sort of a bearing. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about context in a very funny way, multiple contact right. points. And then there is directional slides. Horizontal slide goes that way. But you also have a lot of brackets and things that are not just a, a, a block of material. So say something is a sticking out, holding like this. Mm -hmm. And then you have a vibration frequency that can go this, that, or... Sure. You know, put in a physics way, there are vibration modes that are, can be uh, analyzed. And some modes are kind of uh, bizarre. So if you have a table like this, I can predict there is the first two modes can be a bend this way, because that's the easiest way to bend. And another one, because it's a long object, is a twist mode. And the one that is hard is actually bending in the plane that way, because you have to bend across to this big material, so it's very stiff. So, so uh, or you can have a, a vibration mode with the legs going like this. Okay, so, so there are many modes. Okay, so let me show you a cool a technique, uh, uh, what I call the phase conscious imaging. Rather than explain mathematics, I will just say it graphically. So X-ray beam comes here, and it, it, it sees the flat area. What it does, it gets observed, it goes right through. So direction doesn't change. So if, if you have a, this prism-like structure, if this were visible light, you come here and bend that way. But as I said, X-ray bends the other direction, so it bends like that, in a small angle, very small angle. And if it's something complicated, it will actually come and well, straight as you come out, you will bend, and you bend here, and so you get some compound. Uh, at the end, there is some bending angle reflecting what is total amount of, of phase shift. So, so that's something you have to understand. 
the phase shift is related to the bending angle. Okay, this is the whole concept of the entire thing I talked about, right? Either the zone plates or MLLs or uh, how the transfer function is defined. Uh, so what we can do is uh, put a big detector down here and come out whatever through the sample. And it looks kind of a very nasty looking thing, but uh, you, you look at this pattern and then you move sample a little bit and it moved. It, it moved in a kind of funny way. But uh, we can analyze this and, and say what is the average bend angle in this direction versus that angle and relate to phase gradient in horizontal versus vertical direction. And this illustrates how this is a speed up uh, image. When you come in, oh, I won't actually see in uh, real action. So you're looking at this. And then as we do the fluorescence measurement, so it's measuring a, a, a fluorescent signal of a different detector. And this is looking at analyzing this. You, you can see the uh, uh, gradients. And you can actually predict what's going to happen. Every time it goes to some structure, you a big motion. Okay? So it's not constant motion. It's jitter depending on how it moves. And it's jitterless now because there's no material. OK, so uh, we can actually image the structure. This is actually a platinum structure uh, written as a letter S. And we can measure the elemental distribution as well as the uh, phase uh, uh, gradient uh, seen by x-ray. and then. Uh, because it's a gradient, which is a derivative of a phase, we can integrate it back in a self-consistent way and analyze how the object should look like. So, uh, you know, uh, this is the SCM image, this is the uh, fluorescence image, and that's absorption, and that's a vertical, horizontal a, a gradient, and then you uh, integrate it that. Okay, so already this is a data that's now uh, uh, many years old. So right now we can do much better. It's quite old data. And we can use it for uh, real material. So this is a, a solid oxide fuel cell, which has a, it is an anode, nickel oxide, and the YSG is, stands for yttrium stabilized zirconia. So it's zirconium oxide with, with, with uh, yttrium uh, doped. And then we did the measurement and looked at the uh, elemental distribution and uh, amplitude and phase. And then taking the ratio of these two, we also see a unique fingerprint material, namely the, uh, this value changes from nickel to YSG. And you can see the part of the nickel has different contrast than YSG. It's related to this. And if you look at the phase image, it's as good as a fluorescence image. And uh, if you look at SEM, they look similar but not the same because uh, SEM can only see the surface. There's actually a big hole here. It doesn't show up, but you can see with X-ray. Okay, so um, a few more things. And there was a sample from NASA. Uh, they wanted to look at the uh, elemental composition of a uh, what's called the uh, interplanetary dust particle. So these are dust particles that form in the solar system. And some of them end up in an up atmosphere and kind of floating around. So they send a big high altitude uh, plane, go and collect. And the reason being complicated that the, uh, not all 100% samples are pure. Because every time you <laughs> open things and collect, you have uh, collection of a dust particle that is from Earth. So what they typically do is they do the SEM and screen it to figure out uh, which one's real, which is fake, and then we can separate them and send to us. So uh, they measured it with a TEM or a TEM grid, and this is basically a carbon uh, uh, layer. And we transfer sample uh, using a very fancy uh, surgery technique. So uh, the person who prepared it was genius. He put a little carbon ring, and then he cut it around, picked it up with a pin, and this is about 50 micron small, and put it on our sample holder. And then we also broke a little a standard uh, material, the reference material, to, to quantify a, a composition which is uh, usually grown on the uh, silicon nitrogen membrane. We broke it, it took a little shot, place on it. So if you blow up, it looks like that. 
and that's where the sample is. And the sample is 80 nanometer thick, and we get sufficient intensity to analyze composition. So that was pretty cool. And this is data recently published. I didn't say here, but it's uh, uh, advanced energy material. The people have discovered, uh, um, uh, made a, a new uh, solid electrolyte for battery. So battery electrolyte is usually a liquid, and liquid is sometimes not very uh, um, convenient because uh, the solid is easy, so they develop solid electrolyte. And uh, uh, they want to study the uh, nanoscale structure and relate the, uh, uh, the interfaces of, of, of nanostructure to the performance. So say in a simple way, if there are a lot of particle structure, then you form a different pathway to the current path. So, so the, uh, um, one would think that if there is no impurity, it may be better, but uh, in this case, the, the diverse interface is actually much better. So uh, we, we actually measured and, and it was published. I'll just pass it right through. And some people like to study uh, 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 a, uh, how um, the plants uh, uh, react in, 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 in environment. In this case, that um, uh, uh, nanoparticle, basically toxin, is generated uh, from uh, diesel fuel because uh, diesel fuel contains additives. So every time the car drives on highway, this particle form and then it gets in the environment. And there's a worry that uh, you will eat this. So what they did was they collected the tomato root plant and figure out how it gets uptaken into the root system. They actually did more uh, 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 thorough work depending on how the, 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 the local chemistry of a surrounding nanoparticle uh, can be more easily absorbed versus uh, less easily absorbed. And so they wanted to look at uh, where the particles end up across the cell membrane and cell wall. And so we have sufficient resolution to see. So that's 200 nanometer bar, and we can see all these little things. Little particles. So that's element specific. Yeah, yeah. This is a this is a fluorescent signal from cerium. So it, it, every time you see cerium, we we infer this is cerium oxide particles. How the X-ray cannot see oxygen, so we have to have an intelligent guess. It, it could be oxygen or nitride, have no guess. If you're looking only to the fluorescence. You can do spectroscopy and find out, but that's a more complicated uh, problem. So uh, this is another published paper. Uh, a local scientist uh, looked at the uh, basically grass uh, collected in, in the Jamaica Bay, uh, New York area, and wanted to look at the, how the uh, heavy metal pollutants are uh, distributed in the root. And so we, we image that. So I want to end with the uh, tomography data set. So what we can do is you can take a series of 2D projections at different angles and the mathematically you have a, a enough a, 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 a parameters to solve the, 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 the unknowns in the material, namely uh, if you consider object as a n by n, okay, a, a, a number of pixels with an unknown uh, uh, um, sample, if you project in a different way and uh, it's equivalent to path integral across different directions, and you do enough of them, you can solve it mathematically. So people are called this uh, CT, uh, you know, because it's used by computer to do uh, uh, tomography, but uh, yeah, so we call it lucid tomography. And so, we did that and reconstructed. Uh, I'm sorry that the light's kind of not very good. So the yellow was uh, iron, and blue was gadolinium, and green was cerium, and red is gallium. So we can actually uh, distinguish a nanostructure of different elements. So this is quite powerful because now we have an unknown sample. We can look at it in 3D and analyze the structure in three dimensional way. Of course, it takes a really long time. So this is scanning? Yes, it's <laughs> quite a bit of work. So say this was my sample and you scan it, uh, scan it, produce right. image, and then you rotate, scan it scan again, it. produce scan. image, and on and on and on. So here I can tell you what you did. We did 61 projections over plus minus 90 degree with a 3 degree interval, and then we collected this many pixels, and, and 
a resolution of uh, uh, 10 nanometer pixels. In this case, there's another data we collected smaller. And it took about 20 hours. So uh, this is kind of time um, intensive technique, but uh, if you have to do it, you have to do it. So, all right, so that's my last example. So uh, thank you for your patience. And if you have any questions, I will answer as I can. So, the, the, if you go to a web page, we put 2 to 25 kilohertz. That's based on the ability to tune energy using a monochromium. But uh, the, all our nanofocusing optics cannot work on entire range. For the zone plate, we can go 6 kilohertz up to as high as you're willing to go uh, within the efficiency loss you willing to suffer because it's not very efficient in high energy we can cover so typically use a below 12 kilovolts down to six and the uh, multi-layer lobby lens which has a uh, uh, better resolution uh, we can go around 12 and above and, and yeah so so unfortunately we cannot uh, do high resolution and really low energy. The reason is that uh, the, the focal length scales with energy. The lower the energy, the shorter the distance, and you're running out of space. And so, and what is the uh, uh, efficiency of the, of the lenses? How much do you lose? Yeah, so uh, you will be very disappointed. So the currently the um, multi-layer Lowry lens with a better focusing. At about 12 kilowatts, we get about two to three percent. And uh, uh, zone plates, and, and at, at around 10 kilowatts, we get something like a uh, half percent. And you know, every time we are excited about new light sources, it's because we can then make the optics more efficient. <laughs> but we can make the <laughs> light sources become more powerful. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's, so, that's a dirty secret of the industry. <laughs> sure. I was, was going to ask a kind of a loaded question. Um, you know, 20 hours to take a picture. Do uh, the picture. There has to be, there has to, well, to, 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 to complete this yes. experiment. Yes. Um, you have to think pretty carefully about which experiment you want to do. Sure. What, what picture is worth taking. Yes. So, so this group uh, um, studies, okay, they're, 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 they synthesize a material, starting with the initial compounds, uh, two different types of oxide, and you cook it, center it at a high temperature. And what happens is that uh, the, the result of different products come. And then there, there, are, there are some products that are not known before, but tend to form. And that has kind of an interesting property that, that give you a, a better performance of material. That's kind of interesting. So they want to know how these are specially correlated and, you know, what happens. So it's difficult to do that with 2D because the, it's, not rare, it's not common, it's very rare. So you have to look to the big volume. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, 3D is what we decide to use, and it works pretty well. Uh, uh, if you try to section it, then there is always, you know, you have to be lucky or not lucky, and also to not get a good uh, volume representation. So if you're super lucky, you found in the first slice, but you think it's a high volume fraction, but it may not be true. So, yeah. and yeah. so he, sure, you have to have a definite reason why you do that, and. A lot of experiment, uh, uh, a lot of experiments when we discuss with you, okay, if you like to do tomography, basically you will run two samples for whole your beam time. They say, no, thank you. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, no, I, if, you know, you'd be pretty disappointed if you, if, <laughs> how long do you have to wait before you can come back again? <laughs> but, but though, uh, 
uh, I think that the users and being data scientists tend to become uh, a bit lazy. We rely more heavily on automatic uh, uh, data acquisition system and a lot of uh, automatic workflow. So we don't mind putting something at nine o'clock and at night and run all night and then look at the you know evening and put another sample up and yeah. during the time we discuss other things. So it's also not that bad. Sure. Sure. Yeah, but but just to give you reference to uh, your students, scanning microscopy in general is very expensive technique. If you do full field, you don't have to do this. You take a snapshot. So the state of art full field. If you do a full field tomography measurement on this scale, you can do ten to thirty minutes. <laughs> so you can run, you know, easily, you know, ten twenty samples a day as long as you have enough grad students are alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. then, you have to look at, then you have to look at the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> or stay with you to, to, to go through. <laughs> okay, good. Any questions? All right. All right. Thank you again. Thank you.